Okay, you're now um, we're now being recorded, so uh, you can so that you can see this afterwards, whenever you feel like it, on on YouTube. Hi there, Trevor. Hey, Ron, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Could you put your camera on, please? I'm I'm mobile today, so I can't really put my camera on. Okay, that's that's not bad. It's not a bad reason. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lot of good reason. Okay, folks. Um, okay, it's time. It's time we start. I know that doesn't mean more people won't come in, but anyway, you, you know, Melinda, that you've got two two of you on here. Really? No, I don't know that. Okay. Well, it's very interesting. One of you's one of you's. Well, one of my one of me is the, my mask. Apparently, that's that's what I was about to say. <laughs> You're doing yeah, very well. I beat well. you to it, didn't I? You did. You're you're acting the part. Okay, folks. So um, just to let you know, amazingly, we're entering our our fourth year, which is quite amazing. And uh, there are quite a few people who've been with us from the very, very, very beginning, which is very nice. And um, so uh, the the rules are: I chat for as little as I can, which doesn't always work out. So, but, um, and then, it, then it, then it's you, which is, which is much more interesting because, because everybody is wearing a mask or not, and we'll soon find out. Okay. Masks. Masks is a, is a big topic. It, it, it got bigger the more I was going into it. And, um, I will cover widely. And, uh, since masks, can be discovered everywhere. And I will do so as briefly as possible. So what do masks cover up? Uh, do they cover up or do they expose is one question. The notion that people in general wear masks, I think everybody, I think everybody agrees to, which is interesting. The connotation is that this is not a favorable thing. I would like to check that with you whether wearing a mask is obviously and always a bad thing. Um, I, it seems, I think, that we wear masks all the time. We're all acting a part. We play at being somebody. Sartre, in uh, Being in Nothingness, describes observing a, a waiter at a cafe. I quote what he, what he wrote. We need not watch long before we can explain it. He's playing at being a waiter in a cafe. There is nothing there to surprise us. I close the quote. Um, are we being ourselves when we do something? Or are we acting at doing it and being it? After all, Shakespeare said, uh, uh, declared that all the world's a stage and that all the men and women are merely players. I wonder. We change our masks according to context, consciously and unconsciously. Masks for being friends, siblings, parents, at work, at play, at parties, at dinner, etc. All different masks. I was told by a, um, a business executive that she thinks very carefully about what impression she makes to, she wishes to give, sometimes changing in the car between meetings, uh, various meetings, different places, including makeup. That's very, very interesting. Is identity the result of how we assume people see us? Or does our identity come from within ourselves with no regard to our others? Masks are presumably a form of protection, but from what? Uh, from others, from ourselves? Look, we come to Zoom in our masks, right? In this little square. Although masks have presumably the same function on Zoom as they have at personal face-to-face -face discussions, they are possibly more flimsy on Zoom. So, um, for example, um, people, uh, we don't think twice about getting up or eating or knitting or behaving as we do on the phone. The phone somehow being quite a solid mask. This assumes that we are more authentic on Zoom. Are we more ourselves? After all, we do all sorts of weird stuff that we wouldn't do when we were, when we were in company. Um, 
When we look into a mirror, do we see ourselves maskless? No, we see what we think is how others see us, i.e. objectively, in inverted commas, through taking away the subjective subjectivity of others. But the fact that we see ourselves doesn't mean that we really do. The mirror is a reflection of our subjective view of ourselves, no more accurate than an outsider's view. Different, yes, but no more accurate. Because of that, we have no idea how others see us. No idea. The mirror shows us the me, the object that hides us, protects us from the I, the subject, the self, that is permanently hidden. We can try looking at ourselves through multiple mirrors of mirrors, but that doesn't get us to the more the merrier and thus the more real. All we get is multiple copies of the same, i.e. the similar, disappearing into theoretical infinity. Infinity never clarifies anything. It was Kant, whose the thing in itself was supposedly behind the mask, hiding the real thing. As far as I'm concerned, folks, the only real thing is Coca-Cola. All masks hide something from someone, even if there are different ostensible reasons. Religion is good at this. If religion likes it, then non or anti-religious people are against it. Look at, look at the burqa and France banning it in 2010. The burqa covers the face, leaves slits for the eyes. We can call that a, a, a gate through which the wearer looks out at the people who can't look in. I had a very ex interesting experience in uh, uh, Dubai um, quite a few years ago. Um, I was there for a, a conference and, and a woman came up completely burka from top to bottom, one of those black things with a tiny slit for eyes. The eyes were blue, which surprised me. And I'm more surprised was that um, she spoke in a Northern English accent. And I was completely, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't sort of put these two together, this, this black clothed with a slight slit and Northern English accent. It was, uh, it was really, really weird for me anyway. Um, the re religions are good at covering women up. In Islam, religious Jewish women and Christian nuns. Are there masks for them or, or insisted upon by men to protect women? Protect them against men who are covering up the women? Very, very strange, but still, there we go. There you go. So we are offered masks all the time. Churches that offer us salvation. Lawyers who, that offer us help against authorities, police that offer us protection against people with other masks. We are not far away from the COVID masks and the controversy that they brought. What was that all about? We were asked, re required by law, to wear masks to protect others and ourselves. Masks became suddenly a, a cause celebre for and against democratic rights. People were verbally and sometimes physically attacked for wearing masks. Which of the sides was for democracy? The deep down worry seems to have something to do with hiding one's authentic self. This brings me to the imposter syndrome, feeling that, that really you've got a mask and, and nobody knows, but, but, but basically they, they can. Believing that one's mask will be mm. discovered. I, I am continually amazed by um, celebrities who seem to have everything, but, they, but sometimes they come out, they admit their secret fears of being discovered for what they really are, and they seem to have everything. So there's, there's this thing about stepping outside one's comfort zone. Is that taking off one's mask? Self-help gurus and books talk about finding one's authentic self, yet self-help is the art of getting people to put masks on, not help them in taking them off. Our masks are lies to ourselves as much as to others. We are so used to our masks that we become the masks and the masks become us. Hey, but sometimes 
it is the mask that makes the object authentic. The Theus, the Theseus ship, which you've probably heard about as a, 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 a mythical ship from ancient Greece that um, gradually uh, was worn, worn down by the sea and they kept on changing bits of it. And it was still the Theseus ship always, even there was nothing, even there was nothing left. So um, there's nothing left of the original. It got, had got rid of its mask, that which made it authentic, but still stayed the Theseus ship. Now, AI, got to talk about AI, I have to, right? Do it every time. AI doesn't have masks. AI has no feelings and has nothing that it needs to hide. So any, any AI is equivalent to a psychopath. That is its danger. AI does not do approximations, unlike humans who deal only in approximations and understand only that which is approximate. AI will take instructions literally with no interpretations. AI will understand what we said, but not what we meant. I say that that is the danger. AI is not smarter than humans, despite what you read every day. It's not, it's not. AI is not malevolent either. It simply does what it is told without interpretations. It sees only in straight lines. If you give a powerful machine a goal, can you be sure it won't adopt an inappropriate strategy? Can you rule out unintended consequences? If you tell it to solve diabetes, are you certain it won't kill off everybody with an obese BMI? As machines learn, they develop unforeseen strategies at rates that baffle their programmers. That's obvious. We, we think in strange ways and stuff. They don't. They'll do something that we don't, we don't understand why they're doing it. So um, one of the pioneers, cybernetics pioneers, Norman Wiener said ages ago, he, he, he likened AI researchers to the sorcerer's apprentice who cannot control his master's magic. But look, chat GPT launched last November is so good because it seems so human, mimicking human speech and phraseology. We are comforted and comfortable, yet we are chatting with a psychopath. And yet, research has demonstrated that robots are more frightening when they resemble humans. We have no problem with, with funny machines and they'll talk back. If we see a human looking like a human, it is, it is, it is frightening. Um, and yet, they are the most dangerous when they have become people we know. A swindler used artificial intelligence technology to pose as the friend of a businessman on, on a video call and defrauded him out of almost half a million dollars. People said that the victim received the video call last month from someone who looked and sounded like his close friend who asked him to transfer money to him. The caller was a con artist who had used AI to alter their face and voice. Deep fake, very, 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 very dangerous. We, especially in politics, we see, we see politicians doing stuff and we, and, and, and we fall for it, but it, it might not be them. It's them, but, it, but it's, it's, it's not them. They're being, they're being manipulated. This is using AI as a mask, a mask that res results in a, in, a, in a disappearing trick, like the invisibility cloak in the Harry Potter books. Mm. Now let's move away from that and move on to marketing, which is only masks. Mar marketing is all about masks, making us believe that what we see is what we need. There are four Ps in marketing. Those of you who do the marketing or did the marketing know about that, right? And she knows who I'm talking to. Um, product, pricing, placement, promotion. With packaging as the ultimate mask, 
we are faced with marks when we go shopping. It's packaging. Um, let, let's look at Fo Volkswagen that has lots of different, lots of different brands, masks, but possibly the same engines. They're tailored to different customers. They'll buy, they'll buy the brand that appeals to them because what they're being sold. Uh, recently announced, by the way, uh, Americans will, will know this, that Bud Light, the beer, risks losing its status as a top-selling beer in the United States after a short drop in sales triggered by a marketing campaign with a transgender influencer. The, ban, the brand was hit by a boycott organized by conservative drinkers after it teamed up with Dylan Mulvaney, a 26-year-old transgender, transgender woman who has 10.7 million followers on TikTok. They lost a fortune, a fortune. It, uh, the things dropped by, um, sales dropped by 25.7% uh, in a week, which is incredible. It's the same beer, okay? It's the same beer, but a different mask. So now we're going to something very slightly heavier, but very slightly. We're going to talk about science for a minute. What has science got to do with masks? Everything, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, let me just say that there is, a, there is a limit to our imagination. Let me put it like this. Um, we can imagine only what we can imagine. So in quantum mechanics, we can only think about particles as being points. But they're not points. They cannot be points. It's the only thing we can imagine when we say particle is a is a is a, is a point. So I am imagination is a mask that hides something that may be happening. I say maybe happening because you know I don't like saying happening. Uh, this is why there is no reality. It's impossible to get to it. We we are limited by the imagination that that sees that sees the reality that we can see and we can't, we can't get out of that. But physicists often use masks to explain natural phenomena until they are unmasked by other physicists who use their own masks. So some, some of the best, most convincing masks consist of mathematical equations. No, that work, one, yeah, of course. Yeah. That work um, by proving natural phenomena but actually work only by proving the equations themselves to themselves. An example is the proof that time can theoretically go backwards, not only forwards. This is testable mathematically, but not in the universe outside of mathematics. Mathematics is the mask. Any mathematics here, mathematicians here will kill me. So um, I'm, I'm wondering about numbers, which is my won't. Um, if, if they work, they are masks for things where we pretend that there are things that aren't. What is a number? A number about anything, what, what, what is it? What, what does it stand for? So two plus two is four. But why and how? I will tell you that two plus two is two. Why? Well, well that is also one times two. Because there's only, there's only one of them. That things are the same in every way, in the same location, do not exist other than being one thing. By the way, it was uh, Leibniz who, uh, called the Leibniz principle, said that if two objects have all the same properties, they are in fact one and the same. So you got, so in order to solve the problem, we put, we put things with numbers. So mm -hmm. we say two apples plus two apples, four apples no problem but what about two apples and two pears what's that that's four pieces of fruit and now we get into even we get into even more more problems because um numbers are problematic as far as i can see them they work because of approximations i.e masks approximations are the ultimate masks that cover up the reality i.e the non-reality of the exact so no apples are the same. Two apples and two apples make sense only if you think about them as approximate apples, right? 
you can say two green apples and 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 two green apples, but there are no apples that are exactly the same the same green. So that's my problem with uh, numbers, but don't worry about me. Carry on as you were before. It's just my problem, and it's and it's masks as far as I'm concerned. So um, in language, oh, oh, I'm way behind. In language, approximation is the mask that allows us to understand each other. As with numbers, language works because it is approximate according to context. It is when we ask what particular words really mean that we start to disagree. Okay, so I've um, got to leave out lots of stuff. Sorry about that. Um, I just want to mention that uh, philosophers have offered various insights and perspectives on the mask that we, we all wear, both metaphorically and literally. There are a couple of ones I will mention, like um, I mentioned uh, Sartre, explored the, the concept of authenticity and the masks we wear. He argued that individuals often hide their true selves and adopt social rules and personas to fit in with social expectations. Um, Sartre emphasized the importance of embracing one's freedom and individuality by removing these masks and living authentically. I don't see that. I, I, it is completely untestable. Uh, authenticity means telling only the unvarnished truth. How can that be? Can one be maskless in a masked society? I would tell you about Nietzsche, but um, we are running out of time and you you obviously want to talk and you will. Um, I just want to mention Plato. One has to mention Plato if we're if we're here, right? Um, there's a famous uh, allegory of the cave, um, which he describes individuals who are chained in that cave and can see only shadows projected on the wall. These shadows represent illusions or false perceptions of reality. Plato suggests that individuals wear metaphorical masks as they are often unaware of the true nature of the world and are trapped in a realm of appearances. Well, you know what I think about the true nature, right? True nature of the world. For those in the cave, what they saw were not illusions. They were illusions for those outside who were living their own illusions, wearing their own masks. In fact, the one who escaped the cave was blinded by the sunlight, seeing everything as illusions and hurried back inside the more comfortable truth. I would mention Hegel because there's a Hegel fan here. Are you here? Okay. Just very, very, very brief. I have to. Just to. Um, in the. <laughs> in the. In the works of Hegel, the specific concept of mass is not extensively discussed. However, Hegel's philosophy does touch upon themes related to masks and identity in broader terms. Hegel's philosophy emphasizes the development and realization of self-consciousness within the social context. He argues that individuals establish their sense of self through a dialectical process of recognition, wherein they seek acknowledgement and validation from others. This process involves an interplay of masks, roles, and social ex expectations. Um, I've, I was shortened this, which is a pity because Hegel can't really be shortened, but Hegel's dialectic works through opposites and clashes between them to form a new uh, reality. Um, I particularly wish to bring up the position of Emmanuel Levinas, a prominent philosopher of the 20th century who developed um, a philosophy centered around ethics, which we haven't mentioned at all. Ethics and, and the encounter with the other. And um, his, his whole um, point of existence was the, the ethical existence. That, that was it. And uh, it, it was a reaction to and largely against the position of Heidegger and Hegel. Existence was linked to the other. It was a purely ethical philosophy. What, 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 uh, while he did not specifically address Mars in his writings, he did discuss the importance of the face in his philosophical framework. 
I, I um, according to Levinas, the face plays a fundamental role in human relationships and ethics. He argued that the face of the other is a unique and ir irreplaceable presence that demands ethical responsibility from us. The face for Levinas represents vulnerability, individuality, and the transcendence of the other. Very, very, very interesting, by the way. The face as maskless. Um, in, in art, obviously, there's a, it's full of masks. There's the, um, there's the ritual and traditional masks, the symbolism and metaphor. Um, there is um, there the portraiture and self-identity, surrealism and the unconscious. I'm not going through them. I'm just giving the, the, the headlines. There's performance and, and theater. Um, look, they can be seen in theatrical productions such as Greek tragedy or Japanese no theater, where they help actors transform into characters and embody different roles. The exaggerated features and expressions of theoretical masks enhance the visual impact and emotional resonance of the performance. Um, I, ju I just want to mention Picasso as, a, as, a, as an example. Uh, when we see what we see in, in Cubism as masks are for P Picasso, the unmasked truth for him. That is how he sees the object. In passing, let me mention for one of, one of our friends here, uh, stand-up comedy, in which the comedian engulfs the audience in an array of masks. I will finish soon. Uh, mm -hmm. Literature, which some of you are very, very interested in. Um, there, it's, a recurring, it's a recurring theme. The symbolism of deception and identity. Uh, this can represent themes such as duality, hidden motives, or the tension between appearance and reality. For example, in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, the Shakespeare that the character Hamlet wears a metaphorical mask of madness to deceive those around him. There's the exploration of social roles and uh, ex expectations. Um, we've got um, conform to social norms, such as Scott Fitzgerald's novel The Great Gatsby explores the masks characters wear in high society to project wealth, success, and, and happiness. Um, there's the metamorphosis by, by Kafka, representing a character who undergoes a physical transformation into an insect, serving as a metaphorical mask that reveals deeper as existential themes. Um, a contemporary example on TV is a series succession. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I strongly advise it, um, in which metaphorical masks play a central role, where everyone wears a, a, a mask for everyone else, including the almost sh Shakespearean juxtaposition within the family itself. It's extremely interesting. I, um, I really strongly uh, think you should see it. Um, Masks are a particularly interesting phenomenon in that they take on a role of contradiction and paradox that is central in life. Um, that's, this is where I basically want to finish, but uh, masks cover up what is there in order to ostensibly enhance it. Instead of taking away to get to reality, they hide reality in order to give the illusion of reality. Masks cover everything. They are between what is and us. Since we can never take off masks, we can never get to what is, never, i.e. reality, and have no way of knowing that there is an is. What is, is infinitely hidden. And here's a quote from Oscar Wilde, just to finish off. Man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. Um, I, I, I must disagree with Oscar Wilde here. I never disagree with him, but um, this though can never happen. Mask or no mask, you are whatever you are, and you don't know what it is, etc. That is the end of my very, very brief 
um, exploration of masks. There's lots more. You lucky people won't hear it. And now, if you put up, up yellow hands, anybody who wants to talk, I'll be very, very pleased to, to have you on. Oh, I've got lots of hands. Uh, um, OK. So the first one is Alan. You were actually the first here, which I admire you for. And you definitely deserve to be first. And then go for it. <laughs> well, I'll compliment you. I think um, I like the fact that you brought up uh, counter the counterfactual aspect of mass and uh, the approximation aspect of mass. But what I really wanted to discuss or really wanted to introduce was um, a kind of criticism of of um, of what I heard, uh, which sound rather uh, monolithic, uh, that uh, you know we may, we wear a mask, and uh, and perhaps that mask sticks with us, and and such. Um, a book that I thought of when I when I first uh, heard uh, or saw that you were talking or introducing the subject of mask was. Uh, uh, Irving Goffman's uh, the presentation of self in everyday reality, and uh, that was a book that was <laughs> part of uh, general education requirements 55 years ago, and I uh, uh, and I remember it as as perhaps the most uh, the quintessence of the most boring and most um, uh, dry book that uh, I've ever read, or I don't even know if I read it all. Um, at any rate, I picked it up again because of the session, and I found it very interesting. You know, so uh, things changed evidently. Uh, in the book, uh, Goffman uh, takes a position that uh, a very dynamic uh, position, and that uh, mass enable us to interact with each other, and they. Um, uh, for example, uh, I just uh, cut into it occasionally, but uh, this is a statement from it. Uh, uh, the mass uh, involved not so much uh, real uh, agreement as to uh, what exists, but rather real agreement as to uh, whose claims concerning uh, what issues will be temporarily honored. In other words, the mask is a very uh, performative uh, uh, action. Uh, we interact with each other um, in a in a play, and uh, and as such, it is not monolithic. It is very very pluralistic. You know, the, about as pluralistic as as can be. Another uh, thought that I had was. Uh, I, I've been reading Nancy Cartwright's uh, uh, what is it, How to Lie with Physics or known, How the uh, Laws of Physics Lie. Uh, a little bit maybe far out for me, but I, I find it that? very provocative. And uh, the, uh, the notion is that, that uh, fundamental laws are for the model. They refer to the model. They don't refer to the physics. The physics, she claims, is in the phenomenological laws. And those phenomenal phenomenological laws don't fit together very well. They, you know, there are singularities and and uh, catastrophes and whatever in their in their um, in their quilt work. And I think that that uh, in a way uh, also speaks to uh, the um, our mass, our mass aren't consistent. You know, we we go from one situation to another, mm -hmm. and they're very different. And and what we might identify as ourself uh, may be quite uh, quite various. I guess I'll leave it there. Alan, I'm going to, I'm going to invite you again. Um, Wonder, I didn't hear you. Wonderful. I said I'm going to invite you again. The wonderful things you you said about maths that. Uh, that generally um, they think, well, anyway, I agree with you 100%, but by the way, mm -hmm. funnily you mentioned Goffman because I was going to I was going to mention him, but since I was running out of time, I left him out because he's boring. 
but 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 he's, he's the classic, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's actually there. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, could could I please um please ask you all to sp to speak as shortly as possible because that means you can come back again another time. Okay. Um. Okay, Ab Abraham, you're next. Welcome and go for it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the I think uh, the way we uh, know things are uh, various ways. One of them is, I mean, I'm talking about ourselves. I know sometimes better by being exposed to or confronted with who I am not. So in a strange manner that the tension, I would say, or contradiction between who I am, who I'm not, it's hard to grasp it. So for example, I never spoke bad word to my parents, never in my life, single time. That's who I am because I don't know what's inside of me, but at least by thinking about me speaking bad word to my parents, no, it's not me. So more and more as I get older, I, I can get a little, hopefully, better sense of who I am. Uh, the, the, a few years ago, the, I used to carry this stick when I go hiking. So I made it and I walked to the path. People who had dogs, and no offense to, maybe a little bit, especially who carry big dogs, they are very confident like that. They are enjoying life. And they say, if dog comes at me, they say, oh, friendly dog. This is a dog is really friendly. So I don't care if dog is friendly. I want to take a quiet walk. That's my thought, right? So since I carry this stick, from the distance, people who used to, didn't care at all care now. They see my stick, not me. And then they try to do whatever it takes that this dog is safe. So I realized that what's going on nowadays, I don't carry the stick. So I'm, I went back to my old lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Dogs come at me and some of the owners say, this is just friendly dog. But I, I, I was able to see some game going on here. I, I think, uh, I, I make it succinct. I think, uh, like Heidegger said, being in time, we, animal, let's say, they, uh, for the sake of conversation, animal, baby, humans, and old man die, right? Or being is there, let's say. I'm getting older. So after a baby period, generally speaking, we use language. Language can function as a mask, right? And also, as we use language, we navigate hierarchy, bureaucracy, or, or desire, all these things. So in a deeper level, I think all organisms, for their function, they know how to use mask. Nowadays, most sophisticated mask is this technology. So we can go up to into AI, and then the philosophy of AI one of the aspects I see is impermanence. It's totally connected to Buddhism. Yeah, I'll conclude here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abram. I, I, don't, um, I don't see how you could possibly know what you are not. How, how, how does that work? So it's just a glimpse of it, glimpse of it. Not, yeah. Is, is, that, is that a true glimpse of nothing? <laughs> Uh, this is my brainstorm. Give me a break, Ron. I like you. That's why I came here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Abraham. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm now going to um, uh, jump a bit. Up there, I'm going to ask people who I know are going to leave very, very soon. And I hope you don't mind the others. So I think it's only fair, otherwise they'll be gone. If that's all right with all of you, I'm going to ask uh, uh, William. Because you're, you're leaving soon, right? Actually, I'm going to be leaving soon too. Uh, this is ocean. I'm going to be leaving in twenty less, you know, less than twenty minutes. Well, I can't ask three of you to talk at the same time. I'm afraid. I got to do. I've got a. Uh, Bill, I can't hear you. 
I can't hear you. Bill is muted. Unmute your uh, speaker. Where are you? Ah, uh, Bill? I still can't hear you. Okay, sort that out. And uh, M Michael, you're, you're leaving soon, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have to leave in uh, 10 minutes. That's terrible. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, I'll try to, to be brief. So first, I'm very happy that I'm uh, in engineering position and not in, in marketing or sales or somewhere where I have to, to care about my appearance and what to wear and uh, what to talk. Uh, so I, I hate to, to wear masks uh, figuratively and physically. So I, yes, yes. Uh, a personal note, uh, and um, uh, I am glad that I don't have uh, to do it very often. Uh, but uh, one comment that I had was um, about uh, your comment uh, that um, uh, AI does not make any approximations. Uh, and uh, the, this is um, uh, very far from uh, uh, from how uh, any more or less sophisticated software is working. It's uh, all but making approximations. So you, you cannot solve uh, any uh, real world uh, important uh, problems without making approximations. It's just impossible. Uh, I agree though with your uh, larger point uh, that uh, the main danger is probably coming right now from uh, misuse or abuse uh, of uh, AI systems by, by humans. Uh, but this is only for now, because uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, software systems can learn. And uh, they can learn at least at the most fundamental level uh, not differently from uh, how uh, how we humans do this. Uh, so uh, we probably take advantage uh, from some uh, hardwired in our brain uh, structures that make some forms of learning much easier and much faster. But uh, there is no uh, uh, there is no really fundamental reasons why it cannot be reproduced uh, in uh, AI. And so uh, uh, the real uh, worry is about uh, oh. runaway uh, AI systems. And uh, this worry, I believe, is well justified. Because we know runaway physical systems. Uh, for instance, um, uh, the uh, a new nuclear explosion uh, is the result of runaway chain reaction uh, in uh, fission uh, reaction. Uh, but uh, at least in this case, it was predicted, it was understood uh, before the first uh, nuclear device uh, was uh, designed. But we still know that uh, it can easily lead to catastrophic outcomes. Uh, but uh, there could be a really worrying possibility of run away software system that uh, does it uh, not uh, as uh, its designers or its developers uh, intended, because uh, it, it may be impossible uh, to predict uh, such kind of situation. Uh, and uh, so, and especially since we know, now we know how to make uh, AI that behaves largely like humans, uh, and uh, we give access to some of our AI systems uh, to large body of knowledge available through the internet. Mm -hmm. I think this is a real possibility. Uh, and uh, uh, if it needs to wear masks, back to our original topic, it will wear masks. And uh, we will not be able to distinguish 
uh, what masks uh, it's wearing at, at each given moment. Uh, so uh, that's what, uh, all, all that I wanted to say. Okay, thank you, Michael. I'll be with you in a sec, Ocean, but I, I have to, I have to make an important point here, Michael. My point was the exact opposite to what you said. The exact opposite. I said the danger comes from AI and not from humans. AI does not understand humans. Humans do not understand AI. The, 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 there is no way of stopping it because we're not speaking the same language at all. You can, you can, you can have, you can go to, to Vienna and you can ban mm -hmm. a nuclear weapons and it, it might be done, it might not be done. You cannot stop AI. You can't, you can't stop it. Not only can you not stop it, mm -hmm. you can't really tell it what to do because it's doing its own thing. Things that we don't understand. That was my point. Since we okay. are, since we are, yeah. no, no, because no, it's very important. It's very important. I'm, I'm, I know that everybody's talking about um, uh, controlling AI. I know that. And I, I'm the only one I know who says they will, that it, it can't be done. If, if an alien comes here, we won't be able to talk to the alien. We just won't be speaking the same language. That, that's all I'm saying. And you're saying that, that possibly, you said that, um, that AI can be made to look as if it understands. I agree with you. But does it, does it actually feel, it, it can look as though it feels, does it feel, is it sentient? That, that's that's uh, the question. I we have no way to know this exactly because we are not him that's exactly the, that's okay. exactly the point we have no way of yeah. knowing and that is the danger as far as i'm concerned and i nothing know nothing about it that is the danger that that we don't yeah, understand yeah. it yeah i agree in thank this you. case I agree. thank you very very much michael and um wherever you're going i hope it's interesting it's <laughs> by the way uh, yes, am i next i am I I'm next? going to another uh, ocean you're to next another, to another event okay, thank you. about next, how ai next. can be used in education so it's going to be interesting I yes think. it's definitely <laughs> going to be interesting which is a chinese ch uh, curse by the way <laughs> yeah yeah okay so i'll be i i be worried about that interesting bit ocean sorry to keep you waiting i know you have to no leave worries. go for yes. it Thank you. First of all, Ron, it's an honor to join here for the first time. And I want to express my utmost appreciation to hold this kind of meeting where freedom of the speech is fiercely allowed because 90, I have to be honest, 99% of my daily life, I wear heavy mask. I usually tell my students, if you want to succeed in real life, and if you don't want to end up on a, as a homeless person, being a good liar and good manipulator, because if you're honest, you probably end up on the street. So anyway, having said that, Thank you very much, Ron, for this kind of uh, freedom of a speech. Um, I have a dear friend uh, who was a nine, 10 years ago, 39 years old, very homely looking. He never, he was a virgin. He never had a sexual intercourse with a woman, although he had some female friends. But to make a long story short, uh, he was brought up as a single mother and uh, always uh, told him to be honest and be respectful of the woman. And he practiced that, but he never had a girlfriend. Uh, there are some female friends like him as a friend, but never be intimate or romantically involved. And he was committing, he was in, attempting committing. So he told me he's a, as a best friend, he said if he cannot uh, give up his virgin and uh, girlfriend and marry to a wonderful woman to start having father wanted to have a grandchild. But, uh, you know, there's no woman who wants to marry romantically involve her and marry her so. Um, he read all the books like Dr. Barbara DeAngelis, which basically say to be honest and being authentic and so forth. But he never had a girlfriend. He tried hundreds of times, but he always failed. So as a best friend, I don't want to lose him. He don't, I don't want him to commit suicide. So I uh, gave him a couple of books. It was kind of, um, you know, you could say uh, insidious. Well, written by professional con artists, professional uh, pickup artists basically says how to manipulate the emotions of the woman. So uh, like one example, teaching is to never return phone calls every time the girl calls. He's the kind of a guy, very respectful. Uh, he always returned phone calls, but he stopped calling, start following those advices. He, within three months, he gave up the version. Six months, he married. And the last 10 years, he has had a family. And his mother was very happy and he's alive. So I feel like I saved his life by giving 
um, giving giving him a book how to wear the perfect mask instead of being authentic. So this is an example. I have a lot to say about it, but I was a star. Twenty years ago, I was I was a starving professional musician. Um, you know, I just being honest. You know, I want to have a job and so forth. And I started reading the book by Influence by Robert Cialdini, very famous author. He was one time uh, advisor. Uh, advisor for the president Barack Obama. So basically, the book teaches how to how to skillfully manipulate and brainwash and con others for your interest. In, in a sense, you know, influences. And if I had to say, being very really blunt. And after reading, applying those uh, uh, techniques, that, such as law of reciprocation, law of social proof, law of the power of a contrast, and so forth. I can mention forever. It's a great book that they teach in a university. So. I start to, my bank account start to grow. You know, at, time, at one point I was so depressed because nobody gave me the job. I always feel like I was committing suicide because, you know, I'm the on verge of becoming homeless. But I started applying those. A lot of people started calling me back and giving me lucrative gigs. So that saved me. So it's, uh, you know, to, to the bottom line is human beings, all the things to enable us to survive or fulfill our lives. Those things, um, they don't, naturally fall from the sky. We have to go get it. So those limit, the resources are limited, scarce limited, and we have so many people. And each one of us want more for ourselves than other people. I mean, don't, don't tell me you're compassionate people. We, we can talk about that later. But um, anyway, so we have competition means war. So in order to win that competition, you have to be a better salesman. Salesman means the ability to manipulate others. I mean, take a look at you mentioned about Shakespeare. I love Shakespeare. I love Beethoven, Mozart. And in my mind, they are great con artists. They know how to manipulate the audiences, the emotions, like playing the fine piano. So if you're gonna thrive, survive and thrive in this world instead of being the victim, try to wear the best mask you can possibly be. And how about, how about the women? Why women put, I mean, I'm not attacking the women, I, you know, I love women, but why women putting the makeup on their face? Is that a doctor's order for the health reason? No. It's trying to look more beautiful than they naturally look, right? They, they should wear makeup and men should do the same to enhance our own self-interest. So we are here to survive and thrive and enhance our own self-interest. And, um, you know, you, but I, 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 Siri Ron, would do respect to everything you said, with the mask can hide who you are 100%. No, I, as a people who experience in psychology, I can see through uh, people, who they are or, uh, I say there's only one forces existing in the human world that is the greed, including the fact the people who give up their lives. Like I have a best friend is a fireman, and when you know, and some people argue, no, there's a true altruistic um, thing existing in the world. If you think about a fireman, when uh, there's a fire, they don't have to consciously think about the self interest, just jump in. Um, you know, that's right, because that's the mantra you do 24 7. When push comes to the shovel, I was dedicated my life. When push comes to that's like the people in uh, the, the Muslim world. When push comes to shove, I will save my family by killing more American soldiers as possible and become the suicide bomber. So what? That doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't impress me, even so there is a, some kind of altruistic, true altruistic person. You know, so anyway, so that's all I have to say. Ron, again, thank you so much for having this kind of fierce uh, interaction because 99% of the time I have to be the good liar. But here I completely took off my mask and be who I am. Thank you. Excellent. We're very, very <laughs> pleased and I look forward to seeing you next time, uh, which will be after summer holidays. OK, thank you. So thanks for coming. Um, uh, uh, Terry, do, do you do you mind if I jump to William, who's leaving in a second? Thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Th this um, is this is to stop you leaving, by the way. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, I, in thinking about this subject and what I do when I wear a mask, my masks really are the expressive capabilities that I project in every role that I have. In other words, everything I do is masked in some way by the language, by gesture, by tone, by dress. And all the time I'm interacting with others, if this analysis is right, are masked as well. So our interactions are with masked people all the time and distinguishing which masks are at play and which are deceptive and which are not is really an important skill. 
but no way for us to get beyond the idea that we're mass people talking to one another. And I have a sense that in terms of what you said, that is much more profoundly living in that idea that our interactions are with mass people, is that our intellectual spin on the world is in mask, that our language is a mask for describing metaphysics, that our words in mathematics are really summary narratives of the masked world that we see. And if we all live in a world of masks and talk to people who are masks, we can't really say that there's much beyond the masked world. And I think, I think I'm fine with that. And I think that is what I heard you say. And I think it was very profound. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much, Bill. Have a nice time, whatever you're gonna do now. I'll Thank see you. you. I'll see you next time. Thanks. Okay, Terry. Hi there. Hey, how are you? All? How's everybody doing? We're all doing fine. We're all um, masked, heavily masked. Good to see you again, Melinda. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting topic, and I think the thing that keeps striking me is that the intent of your masks is so incredibly important in terms of what you wind up doing with your masks. And 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 I agree with the position that everything we do is masked to some degree. When you interact with a child, do you apply the exact same criteria of perfection for a task that you do for an adult? Of course you do not, because we recognize intuitively that for a child, a small accomplishment as they're growing and developing is actually a major accomplishment and rightfully so. So is that a mask? Are we being false and saying that, oh no, you did not do Da Vinci quality drawing Therefore, I will reprimand you. So there's a lot of complexity going on in this issue of mask about what is the perspective, what is the 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 position of judgment from which we put on our own masks? What, how are our criteria doing that? And I I can't think of a solid answer for that, but I just think it's it's incredible. I, I think of the thing about how people say telling the truth. I'm just telling the truth. You can be an incredibly kind person who tells nothing but what you think is the truth, or you can be the cruelest person on the planet and still stick to the, the motto that you're telling nothing but the truth. So to say that revealing your mask is a simple either or problem is just not the case because you still have your choice of what you do or what you do not do. And uh, that adds an, an entire another level of complexity to these to these issues. So I'll leave it at that on the first point. I just think that's a, a very important and something uh, to me the the idea of, of be good to others uh, to help others. It's a, a simple simple be kind is maybe the simplest thing. Is just an incredibly important factor in the whole issue of of masks. And uh, we to... thank you very much. Yeah, the 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 point is that you made you made it sound as though masks are false. We're not not necessarily false. I mean, right. false so sounds as though you're 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 purposefully being false. And I think we wear masks without even realizing it. You talk to a child, you talk to a brother, you talk to a colleague. They're different masks. I don't think. I don't think we consciously change change the mask. We just it's an automatic, I think, an automatic change. I think. Yeah. Thank you very much, Terry. Thank and you. uh Richard. Okay. Um I know you're going to disagree with my starting point. I always do, I think, so yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I uh I really feel you've got to define your terms because masks. What masks mean depends on the context. And you have mentioned totally different types of mask. Now, if I go into a few of them, you've got the one which, if you're training dogs or you've got a puppy, then you need to get it used to society, get used to other dogs and other people. Otherwise, it will always be shy and likely to attack them. So you make it used to society. And these are interactions with other things. Now, we as children learn to put on polite masks, if you like. Uh, as a young Englishman, I know that you put on a mask to try and hide any emotional feeling. 
Um, I know that people nowadays aren't so good at it, but I mean, uh, those of us who were bred just after the World War or during the World War knows that you mustn't show fear, knows that you mustn't show um, almost anything. You can, because it will let the side down. Um, so therefore, part of it is due to society. But then if you look at the Greek tragedies, you find that the people who wear masks are actually speaking the truth, if you like, in the context of the play. Then if you look at mythology, you find that in almost every culture, there is a trickster. We'll take Loki because uh, it's the easiest one for me to go into. Loki has many masks, an infinite number of masks, but Loki can't decide which side he's on, whether he's on the side of the gods or whether he's on the side of the giants until the very end. He goes backwards and forwards and tricksters always do. And the people who wear masks all the time, this is where you need to be authentic. People who wear masks all the time don't know who they are any longer. Doesn't matter whether they're looking into a mirror or whether they're having to make an honest decision. Take a Johnson, for instance. I would say he wore so many masks, he forgot um, if he ever had what his core was uh, because he was so used to putting forward an act to try and get power rather than himself. On the other hand, if you meet a, a blunt Yorkshireman, and I'm sorry, I'm going into a, a stereotype here, a blunt Yorkshireman who calls a spade a spade and a shovel a shovel, he will probably offend everybody in the room. Uh, it doesn't have to be Yorkshire, put whatever stereotype you want there, you know, sort of. Uh, so masks are both important as part of society, but masks are also a hindrance to finding out. If you're writing, you want to find your true voice. You don't want to write in, in an imitation, however great the writer is, of someone else. So therefore you've got to be authentic. But then again, in the modern world, if you're writing, you've got to be very careful because you can offend a lot of people. Uh, we've had several authors who've offended people. And unfortunately, Whereas I consider a work of art, a book, a painting stands alone, you don't have to consider what the uh, painter, the author was. In the modern world, if you want your creation to be um, put out to the public, to be accepted, then you have to be careful you don't go against modern sensibilities, shall we say. So therefore there's all sorts of masks and some masks um, are totally inauthentic because they're used so that you can trick people out of their money or into bed or whatever. But other masks are purely so that you have social interactions without friction. And then, as I said, you have masks where the personality of the person is hidden because they represent comedy or they represent tragedy or they represent the narrative that leads to that. So there's nothing inauthentic about that because the person is not the human inside. It is the mask speaking. It is the voice of the play speaking. Then you have actors who have taken so many characters that they forget who they are themselves. Uh, I'm really not sure about your reference to AI. Once again, because I don't think we've defined what AI is. Do you need the program, the AI, construct of programs to be actually conscious. Um, is it actually something or is it an imitation of something? I mean, possibly to actually have an AI program that is really capable of wearing a mask in the way you suggest, that would have enough consciousness to be able to lie. And I don't mean program false data, uh, program false information out. In other words, I mean to be able to make a decision and to decide when to say something that's true, say uh, whatever, produce something that's true, or produce something that sounds as if it's true. Uh, because human beings do this all the time. And the mask and lying are totally connected. Even in the innocent social way, white lies and wearing a mask are part of the human construct. Go Richard. on. Richard, yeah. in, in which way could a mask be authentic? And what do you mean by that? 
I mean, in the construct of a play, oh, no. uh, or in a, um, it's authentic if it's taking the story forward in the way you want to. I'm t this is where I say you've got to say what type of mask it is. No, in religion, for instance, and I know neither of us believe in religions, but you have masks that are part of the ceremony. And when the wearer is wearing that mask, whether it's, uh, I've forgotten what the Celtic uh, god with the horns was, but whether it's a, a deer mask with horns or whether it's um, some other mask, they become the um, incarnation of the god to the people who are watching. So therefore, their utterances are considered to be authentic, even if you or I might not consider them to be so. It, I mean, basically... Well, obviously we all think we're being authentic. The point is... Well, do that, we? That, that, ..that nobody is. No, and I'm Can't saying... Be. And I'm saying that, in fact, we all know when we're not being authentic. No, we don't. Uh, well, <laughs> most... Of course we don't. We no. can't do okay. how, how can we know that? Ha have you ever seen uh, P Peter Sellers being uh, in interviewed? I know that when I suppress anger with someone and uh, because I feel sorry for them and I try to be kind, I know when I try to be polite to someone who's just insulted me, I know when I repress my own feelings and come out with something that is, if you like, inauthentic, but is actually better for the interaction within a family or within a class. I don't, uh, I know not to be too sarcastic to students so you uh, use, who are so being you, stupid. So you're using a mask. You said you're trying to do something. You're, you're, you're using a mask. A mask. A mask. When, you're, when you're, say, teaching, which is one of the things that I'm more uh, aware of, just as you are, um, when you have a class and people ask stupid questions, you don't say, that's really stupid. You try to explain to them. And if that doesn't yeah, go... Use, you use do a teacher's not, mask. It's a teacher's mask. Now, this is not inauthentic because this becomes part of you. Wow. Well. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. The, 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 okay. No, no, fine. This is why I say it, but it depends on context. Everything, everything always depends, everything on, depends context. on context. Everything. That's something we can totally agree. There you are. There you have it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> James. Hi. Uh, yeah, this is a great uh, subject. I didn't even know uh, where we would go with this. Uh, I, oh, I didn't know. I, yeah, well, that's good that you got there. Um, I, you know, right off uh, the bat, there's this idea of um, uh, uh, masks as a kind of a universal. Uh, so in other words, don't trust anyone. Everyone's wearing a mask. Um, and, uh, and then there's this conflicting idea that uh, some people are more authentic than others, or I might be authentic today, but I was working yesterday and I'm the waiter in Sartre's great novel uh, uh, called uh, Nausea, Nausea, which is, uh, so you, you know, the, the waiter uh, has to be the perfect waiter. He has to be the, the one that earns his salary and uh, does everything correctly regarding the presentation of the product of the restaurant to the individuals who are eating and, uh, but the reason he brings it up is because the waiter could have bad faith at the same time. The waiter at the same time could be a homosexual pretending not to be homosexual. So in other words, there's the, there's the uh, which, which I don't think Sartre meant that as a uh, slight of the sexuality of anyone. He just simply meant that bad faith, one example of bad faith is that you don't represent yourself um, in a way that violates your own beliefs. So that's, that's I believe, what Sartre meant by exposing that as a case of bad faith. So it's not just being a good at your job. It's kind of like being good at your job to the extent that you're uh, suppressing uh, something you believe is important about who you are. So. I think most of us don't get into, maybe don't necessarily get into those dilemmas or when we get into those dilemmas, we do face a crisis. So I was raised as a musician. I uh, you know, studied French horn 
and everything was a mask, right, that I adopted in order to become good at the French horn and to have a possibility of a life, you know, playing in symphony orchestras, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I completely agree with what uh, Ocean was saying about Beethoven and Mozart, et cetera. Music is strictly a, um, a, a, an effort to control the soundscape, to control a soundscape in order to affect the moods of other people. And uh, the, the, uh, the whole act of being a musician, wearing the right clothes, having the right associates, and this applies to philosophers as well, having the right associations and the right kind of credentials and the right uh, kinds of uh, presentations, uh, just like Mozart and Beethoven, et cetera. It's, it's you know, just like in art, it's just, uh, uh, is, is, is a mask as well. So uh, I, I, I'm kind of like taking that side. Uh, and uh, I, I think part of the problem with your presentation, Ron, is that you are a dualist. You believe that uh, you have a soft dualism. You believe that uh, we are not part of reality, that you are not part of reality, that reality is outside. So as long as, long as you take that kind of a dualistic approach, <clears throat> I think you're going to get into a lot of uh, these difficulties of understanding uh, what what the what the essential nature of human life is. But you did get that correct, I think, that every presentation of ourselves, even perhaps an authentic one, is a is a type of mask that we create. And it's something that I've uh, lived with, experimented with a lot, uh, you know, especially since I have alternate uh, realities that I participate in, uh, poker player, professional musician, um, uh, software engineer. Oh, and about about AI, real quick. Um, the the whole thing about AI is it's like so overhyped. Uh, the ChatGPT is a large language model. That's the most important thing about it. the second thing is that it is programmed in such a way very well using silicon, not anything resembling how we function using water and carbon and so forth. That silicon representation of uh, of uh, which is not intelligent is 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 actually programmed to present expert level essays because of course language is logic. So we can actually use you use computers to represent language, and uh, the 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 you know so we have a essentially a large language model that can basically speak any language and be expert in language, present and present essays, uh, if, wearing a mask as an as, of of an expert essayist, not, not a not an expert human, but a you know in general, but an expert essayist, somebody you know, a, 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 a machine wearing a mask of an expert essayist instead of just being a machine that wears the mask of an expert, uh, the usual thing, uh, an expert uh, uh, drug uh, website or an expert um, uh, uh, accountant and, and a mathematician and so forth. We're, we're kind of more used to those things. Now we have the idea of an expert, the mask of an expert essayist on top of a large cluster of computing power, it, you know, which is just a, a database and uh, you're representing languages. So uh, yeah, so so I just wanted to mention that the AI is like completely overhyped. People should stop overhyping it. It is what it is and, and it's all on silicon. Don't for a minute imagine that it represents something like a human being. Only one point I make. I have to make here. You you misrepresented my uh, view of reality. I do not, and I've never said or even hinted that reality is out there. I said the exact opposite. I said it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because I can't possibly get to it. I have never said anything about it being anywhere. That's very very important. That's a, that's a that's a ba basis of of my thinking, but that's. I think I wrote, I wrote the word down when you said it, so I apologize if I took you literally. <laughs> Thank you very much, James. Van Hoon, are you there? Van, yes. Van, yeah. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for having this wonderful uh, meeting. So a couple thoughts about masks. Um, my thoughts is, are, my camera's not on, but are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple thoughts would be that uh, I, I took a course by Mark Leary on the great courses about persona. And one of the ways that we can think about how people regulate their emotions is that if we can navigate the world more easily, then our emotions are more easily regulated. If we get obstacles in our way, if something is harder to navigate, then we become deregulated. We become, we experience a great deal of negative emotion. And so this relates to mass in the sense that when we meet someone, we might put on a mask and we might hide certain truths that might cause there to be a difficulty in them navigating the world. So for example, uh, with 23andMe and these genetic tests, people can discover that they might have Huntington's or this is a very controversial topic in educational psychology, but we have discovered that IQ tests are highly reliable and highly valid. Um, the same goes for uh, standardized tests regarding the SAT, um, which is that 20 years later, they, they found that people who do well on the SAT, they do have predictive value in terms of uh, scholastic success. It doesn't say anything about happiness. It doesn't say anything about their relationships, but it does say that uh, there is scholastic success with these standardized tests. And so many teachers are having to put on masks and just hide uh, the data that has been out for decades and decades and decades on these standardized tests, largely because they worry that this might demotivate students and it might make it harder for people to navigate the world um, if they were to come across these very uncomfortable findings in science. Now, just to wrap up, I think the basic idea is when we meet people, we want to be able to, especially for an agreeable person, we want to be able to help that person navigate the world in an easier way. But there are a couple of problems that happen with this, which is when we give people compliments and when we stoke their imagination, they, they could believe that they're solving something in their imagination, but it hasn't really changed the environment physically for them to be able to navigate the world. This happens quite a bit when people give positive illusions to others. Um, if we do tell the truth, which, uh, you know, Marshall Rosenberg who came up with nonviolent communication, he talked a lot about emotional honesty and emotional liberation. If we do tell the truth, it does seem like if we're able to talk about our inner experience and, and relate to other people, if people want to relate to us in return, it gives us maximal information flow between both sides to allow to say, hey, if you're feeling sad, what can we do about that? If you're feeling happy, how can I celebrate with you? Um, but, uh, you know, just, just to speak for another minute or so, it seems to me that uh, one of the aspects of science that we found is that if we were to be truly honest about all aspects of that we found in science, some of the truths that we have found are, are profoundly debilitating to people. And that's when we decide to, to step back and not maybe not say something and put on a mask because we worry that it might be demotivating in some sort of way. But at the same time, there's another part of us that thinks, well, it's, we don't want there to be surprises. Right? If we tested something, we get the same result over and over again. We might as well say it so that there's some degree of predictability and we can do something about that, even if it's going to be a shock initially. So in summary, um, there are different types of masks that we wear. One type of mask is we want to give someone uh, just the positive feeling that they can handle a problem, even if they haven't put in the practice. There is another type of mask where we could just say, okay, we need to focus on a goal and we need to inhibit all these other distractions that we have. And we're just gonna focus on this main identity that we have, which is this hard goal to solve and just get rid of all other distractions. And then there's a really problematic type of mask where we actually genuinely lie to people. And um, we use manipulation, coercion, and, and, and bad faith in order to get ahead um, by just not being honest. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much. I just, I just, um, I need to di differentiate between between masks that we put on purposefully because we want to we want to do something, and masks that we that we we just have when we change change status or context or or talk to somebody else. The masks change, and we don't even know it. When you speak to a child, you've got your mask on, but it's not a it's, it's not a bad thing. It's your it's your child talking mask. When you speak to your parents, you've got another mask. You don't you don't physically or, or mentally change masks. When you walk into a room and and speak to a colleague, you have another mask. I don't th I don't think at least I don't. I mean, on purpose change the way I am. In, in the way that I, I talked about the uh, uh, executive who purposefully changes what she looks like in order to be in a certain situation. That's something else. But I think all of us, wh whoever we react to, we, we react differently to our wives or husbands than we do to a brother. We just do. We don't, we don't think about it. So I, 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 I think it's very important. And the, the, the word mask has a bad connotation and that's not that I, I mentioned that but that's not necessarily so it's just it's just a cover to to because we can't get to what we are however much we we like to think that we're authentic we have no way of testing our authenticity we can't we feel we are we feel we are authentic now but actually i don't know what that means anyway thank you very much buddy that's it Hi there. Yep. I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll keep this one short. Um, yeah, like you said, a mask is only like all the different type of masks you talk about is just a cover for oneself, right? So you, you really have to examine what exactly is self. And I, I think you got a pretty bang on with Hegel that self is a reflection or perception of others that you understood and share with them, right? So in a way, mask is a tool. It's a tool that we constantly change because we want to constantly changing ourselves because self is a perception of others, right? So it's really about understanding. You want to be understood. That, that essentially is self. And in, in that way, that's why self is not quite true. It's not really your authentically self in a sense because in order to be authentic, you got to get rid of this self. So in a way, our society uses this quite literally. If you can say selfless act, what exactly, what exactly is that? You don't want to seek recognition, right? Like well, no biggies. Like what, what does that mean? That's exactly the opposite of self because you just remove others' perception of yourself. So therefore, it's a selfless act. But that does not mean it is. You're just unfiltering your true self. It's simply just remove to one's perception of itself. And later on, you talk about, you know, democracy and all, all this, like, mask we wear, you know, Oscar Wilde saying, like, hey, you know, you give him a mask, maybe he will tell the truth. Yes. And in a way, it is offensive to democracy for one reason, because democracy is about combining our thought. It's about sharing who we are, a vote. It doesn't matter whether we're right or wrong. It's just our belief in our way. And it's a voice, right? And so when you put a mask on, it, it is give you the fence or enemy because for one thing, because it's a protection. What does it do? It protects, it's a protects oneself, right? That's what it is. From what? From the consequences, consequences of your action. That's what they don't want to fear. That's the fear part. The fear causes the protection. So the mask they put it on is the protection of one's fear and that removes them from the consequences. And through that removal, you have this unshackled. So in a way, it's an unfiltered thought. So, and we perceive it as a truth, but it doesn't know. A true thought is through examinations and thoughts. So it has to have this re-examining part to be true. So this is not, that's why I said it is unfiltered thought. It's unshackled, the one without consequences, without self in a way, because you don't care what other things. You are protected from the consequences, from the perception. So therefore, you don't have self anymore. Um, and then you talk about AI and so on. Well, it is, it's, it, it's, 
it's like, oh, you know, AI could put on a mask but, and we can put on a mask, talk to the AI. But the problem is we don't understood each other, right? That's what the self is before. The mask we put on is so that we are looking familiar to the other person so they can easily perceive us to them. So when a human put on a mask, because they don't know how AI thinks, so they can't really know what's going on. So this doesn't create an understanding. Without understanding, the mask falls away because you know there's no self, there's no self, there's no need to cover it. It's completely useless. And you know, when we don't understand something, we see this as danger, we fear what we don't understand, right? And and without this bridge, you know, it, it's really hard to do it. So you're in the dark. And the only way to do this for me is courage. Courage is, you know, it's not lack of fear. You got to have fear or something, but you do it in spite of it. So in a way, that's, I don't know how to put this one with a mask yet. So I, I leave it at that. And uh, uh, oh, one more thing. I, I can't wait to see Doctor Who. So <laughs> <laughs> this will be an interesting episode. So thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Roland. No. Who have I got? No, sorry. Sorry. I, I, my eyes dropped. Sorry. Calm down. <laughs> I got to do it in order. Otherwise I get, I get, I get angry, angry notes afterwards. Um, Norman. Yes. Thank you for allowing me uh, to join your meeting for the first time. Uh, the topic was very interesting to me because I have always uh, been interested in understanding what the self was and is. So I went through the great uh, thought and through uh, the controversy over the thinking itself and the theory of knowledge at that time and understanding they left it uh, without resolving that issue. Um, uh, the duality of reality and, and, uh, and our perception has existed since the immemorial time of Epic of Gilgamesh to me, uh, to the present time. And it's getting, uh, it's a sticky situation. You know, in Greek time, they had the uh, reality which is divorced from our reality, which is the uh, the uh, realm of Zeus is. and then there's our reality, which is uh, approximation of the reality, which is in, in the heavens or in the ideal world. Then we come to the um, uh, this definition of the self itself. We didn't uh, define what self is. To me, after uh, uh, delving into uh, the idea, the best definition came from David Hume, who says self is a bundle of perception. If we accept that, our reality is basically a bundle of uh, perceptions of, of what we see. And that's the, 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 we are the product of our experiences and our knowledge. And so our reality becomes uh, what we have been exposed to. And therefore our mass becomes what enables us to perceive that reality, or we are what our mask is. The other part which became uh, very interesting to me was um, to go deeper into understanding consciousness itself. So I read a book by uh, Epstein called uh, Thoughts Without a Thinker. And in that, he suggests an exercise where you uh, take all definitions of uh, adjectives and nouns from your uh, self, take away your being a human as, as, a, as an explanation or as uh, or being a manager or being a teacher, take your roles and see what you end up. When I did that, I went to a black hole in my mind. I saw nothingness. And that uh, coincides with what Ron, you said that, that we are uh, unable to understand reality. 
And that black hole, to me, is in the core of every galaxy, in the core of every particle physics, and the core of uh, our uh, universe. We are faced with a reality which we can't comprehend, but we try to understand it nevertheless. And so when we come to the uh, conflict between um, um, AI and, and, um, and uh, humans, to me, it's uh, professionalism makes us a sort of a computer. When we become a professional through education, we become uh, devoid of uh, uh, feeling of the consequences of what we do. Not, not all of us, some of us do that. And I would point out that Oppenheimer and how the computer of Space Odyssey 2001, how did what we told it to do and Oppenheimer did what we told him to do. So tell me, where is the difference between Hal and Oppenheimer when it comes to the actual uh, uh, execution of the orders? That's my understanding of reality and perception and duality of self and mass. So we are mass, we are also ourselves. If we are uncomfortable with our mass, we change it and we uh, adjusted to what we perceive at the time. Um, there we, I stop. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you and welcome. Josh. Good afternoon. I just, I, I was wondering if you're walking. <laughs> you had to wonder? <laughs> no. You've been walking for two or three weeks now. Yes, I have. <laughs> okay. <Where's my> dog? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so this is a great conversation. Um, and um, I think that, uh, boy, I mean, it intersects with fascinating ideas by a whole host of philosophers. Nobody's mentioned Nietzsche. I just mentioned him, and that's all uh, I'm going to say about Nietzsche. Josh. <laughs> <George, laughs> Josh, Nietzsche is, yes. one of, is one of those on my list that I did not speak about because I saw I was running out of time. Oh, okay. But he needed to be, um, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, but, you know, so instead of Nietzsche, I want to talk about my favorite psychologist who kind of gone by the wayside, a fellow by the name of George Kelly. Uh, George Kelly uh, produced his own theory of personality called uh, personal construct psychology. And one of the fascinating elements of it was his definition of guilt, because guilt is involved in so much that is crucial to our relationships in the social world and our sense of uh, notions like sin and justice and, uh, and ethics. Uh, and also, I think that it pertains centrally to the notion of masks. So Kelly defined guilt in terms of uh, core roles. He called them roles. But for Kelly, a role wasn't something that one puts on just to say a set of, uh, of, you know, of um, elements that tied, are tied together. That, uh, um, what a role is, it's crucially about our ability to anticipate how the people that we care about in our world, uh, not just how they see the world, but how they regard us the role that we play in their lives based on our understanding of their understanding of us. So it's a kind of a reciprocal uh, set of, of anticipations that go back and forth between us and the people that surround us. And that's what ensconces us in our world in terms of knowing who we are so that our sense of ourself, and other people have touched upon this already here, uh, our, our sense of who we are as a self is intricately interconnected with our understanding of of our relationship with other people, what they think about us. And, it, and they don't even necessarily have to like us. That is to say, one can be define one's, one's sense of self in terms of being a bad person or, you know, kind of evil or let's say a Satanist, right? And so then one, uh, that role is dependent on, it's validated by our being sort of, you know, alienated from that segment of society that are not Satanists. 
So guilt arises and, and a sense of personal sin arises when we find ourselves um, cut off from that, from, from that role that we thought we played. In other words, you know, so it, it, it's a sense of sort of self-alienation with respect to who we thought we, how we thought we were understood by other people. We act in such a way, this happens all the time. You know, we, a person is, uh, identifies with a certain community or with a partner, and then they act in a certain, or we act in a certain way. Let's say that we cheat on a partner and we don't know why we did. I mean, we know in one sense, you know, we were attracted to someone else, but we don't, but, but it violates our sense of, of our loyalty to that other person. We didn't think of ourselves as the kind of person who would do something like that. So it's a, it's a kind of a being, uh, being extricated, be, being asked, uh, you know, thrown out of, of, of our, our role. So it's all about sort of anticipations and violations of anticipations with respect to other people. So the way that this, you can see how maybe how this gets back to the notion of masks. So for me, mask really, uh, and again, others have, have you know, I've done, you know, said some very fascinating things about the relationship between mask and say, a system of constructs by which we make sense of our, our, our world, that we, you know, we, we interpret our world, uh, you know, through our own personal vantage, through our own perspective. Uh, and the fact that my perspective is never going to be the same as the perspective of anybody else in this, in this room, for example, um, this first virtual room, uh, means that in a sense, to the extent that we think of an element of masks as being uh, involving a certain dishonesty or a certain fiction, the fiction really isn't in the mask. The fiction is in the difference in the perspectives because we'll never be able to, I, I can try to understand someone else's perspective through my own filter, but I'll never be able to, you know, to do that in a, in a flawless kind of a way. So there's going to be a kind of a, not necessarily a lie, but a gap between us. So if you think about the role of masks or what I would prefer to call it, uh, simply the way that we erect uh, a system of, 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 of a construction system to, to allow us to make sense and to anticipate other people. Um, of course, you know, Ron, as you pointed out, you know, we modify it either deliberately or, or, or automatically in order to, to get along with the people around us or if we feel that there's a gap, they're on, on one side of a moral you know, of a political divide and we're on the other side and we know that we'll never understand each other. So th th our, our, what people are calling the mask that we put on is really an attempt to try and um, um, to cope you know, more effectively. It's not really, it's, 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 the mask isn't something, and I think that that's sort of the negative implication of mask, that it somehow shuts something off uh, or, or, or disassociates us, ourselves from something authentic. Um, but masks can instead be looked at, again, by looking at it in terms of the fact that we filter our and channel our, the world around us through our own sense-making interpretive apparatus that's constantly attempting to adjust itself uh, to the world. And by the way, I mean, from that point of view, reality is all around us. Reality simply means your, your system from moment to moment, just in order to have a perceptual constancy in the world around you, uh, we anticipate and we expect certain things will happen, that, that there'll be certain regularities. When those regularities are violated, that's a violated of that reality. In other words, it's a, it's a pragmatic notion of reality. Reality is simply the relationship, the ongoing relationship between our expectations and anticipations and whether those anticipations are validated or invalidated. Um, anyway, so, um, so, yeah, as I'm saying, I think the fascinating idea is, is that the lie or the gap is not in the mask. The mask is an attempt to alleviate that gap in many cases, because the mask is, is, is oriented towards making sense of other people and, and, and perhaps even in bridging that gap, because the, the mask is really a kind of a template, uh, a, a way of organizing uh, meaning, uh, you know, events and other people meaningfully in relation to, to what we can relate to. Um, just one quick comment. At this point, I've already talked a little bit too long, but with regard to AI, I think it's important. I'm among those who think uh, there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what AI is, to think of it in terms of doing things that are alien to the way that we think, or that it can learn in ways that we learn, and it can learn, go off and learn by itself and do things that we don't do. AI, first of all, is an element of our human ecosystem. Like a, like a spider's web or a bird's nest. 
or an element of our, of our organ system, like the liver. It is not something disconnected from it because we create it. Um, essentially, it's a freeze frame product. When somebody invents a particular you know, a software chat GPT program, it's a freeze frame product, like a painting that somebody's made or like a, a piece of music. And every time you listen to that music, if you look at that painting, you're reinterpreting it. Now, you might say, well, you know, chat GPT, it's doing all kinds of things. It's making all kinds of changes in itself that surprise us. Well, so can paintings and so can music. And the fact of the matter is, is our arts evolve, our arts incorporate these new ways of understanding ourselves and understanding the world. So built into the notion of chat GPT is our latest understanding of, um, you know, kind of self-organizing systems and all, and all these sophisticated new ideas. And that and this allows them to act in ways that appear to us to be unpredictable and, uh, and, and autonomous. But there, there's absolutely no autonomy there because it's not, a, not a, it's not even just a third aspect of our ecosystem, but there are freeze frame moments. Any particular instantiation will never ever no matter how much it's to surprise us, we'll never do anything that lies outside of, uh, of, of the range of uh, the way of thinking that, that inspired those who invented it. Just like a particular painting just sits there and will continue to be reinterpreted. It's only other living systems uh, that, that learn, truly learn. That is to say that continuously uh, are, are re reflexively changing themselves. Uh, even even paramecium and amoeba do this, uh, but something that we invent is not self. It, 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 it's it, it, it's it's the illusion that it's that it's changing itself because every change it could possibly make has already been anticipated on the basis of the frame of understanding that we put into it. So um, to the extent that we ever get to the point where we will have. Uh, so-called devices that truly will learn and surprise us, they will be organic devices and we will tweak them through genetic engineering, but they'll be already living things that will already be a part of our, uh, our ecosystem. And that's the only way you'll get to what you're talking about in terms of something that can truly surprise us. And even then, I mean, we already have that. We uh, engineer the, uh, genetically the animals around us. They've, they've undergone profound changes from wolves to dog or domestic horses, but they don't go beyond us. They evolve with us because the way the tweaks we make to them based on our knowledge is, is going to provide the guidelines and the restraints on, on how far they can change. Okay, thank you. Thank you, oh. Josh. I, I've got a lot to say about that, but I won't at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Moshe, sorry you waited a long time. Oh no, it's always a pleasure. I enjoy hearing everyone. Um, I, I, you know, I, I relish the questions, so I'm, I'm posing what I'm saying in terms of questions. When you were talking about masks, I was wondering if two masks could be identical. And then that question led me to the question of, of could I wear your mask or someone else's mask? And then I made it made me think that is a mask like a predicate in a sentence, okay? Uh, is a mask a description like a predicate, okay? Uh, can there be, and, and I take as, an, as a, 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 this is a rhetorical question, of course, can there be a predicate without a subject? I, I don't think so. I think the predicates require subjects. Uh, on the other hand, predicates have very, predicates and subjects have peculiar relationship because, um, you know, if a predicate requires a subject, we can ask, is the subject absolute? Does it have to be there or is it a relative thing? And um, so uh, it, could it be relative like relative predicates? Could a subject be relative like relative predicates? And I, I think I take it as an example of this, like if you come into a room and I come into a room and you say it's hot and I say it's not hot, you know, the the relativity of the predicates requires the absolutism of the subject. Nevertheless, a predicate, or even though it requires a, a subject, um, is the only thing that can be known about the subject. You know, we don't know the subject really. We, we know the properties of the subject. So uh, if a predicate, um, if a predicate is what can be known, the subject, although it cannot be known, my conclusion would be, and this you could you, you could argue with me, 
the subject must be thought. The subject must itself at least be intelligible, okay? So we could have knowable predicates and intelligible but unknowable subjects. So this brought me to my last question. My last question is that are our actions actually interactions with other intelligible subjects? In other words, I act morally, I act immorally, but my unknowable subject is interacting with another unknowable subject whose predicates I know. And so I would say, in my opinion, the answer is, to that is yes, our actions are interactions with other intelligible subjects. And that drives me to the conclusion that in that we must be moral, although I will not define what morality is at this particular time. As you would say, that's another subject. Uh, very you. extremely interesting uh, questions there, Moshe. I've got to say, very, very interesting. Uh, that's a that's a, that's a whole topic. You about the subject and the object. It's a it's a very good one. Thank you very much. Let's see if we can get to it at, at some at some point. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, James, you waited a long time with great patience. Is that me, James? I'm not quite sure how many James is there. No, no, James Edwards, you're, you're next on the... You're okay, on the very list. good. You're on the well, list. let me... I think I'll probably be, be brief. It's been a very interesting discussion. And um, I liked earlier presenters, earlier uh, people who shared about filter, talking about filtering. You know, it seems like a mask, if it is to be satisfying at all, really is something that is filtering, filtering information rather than some kind of, uh, uh, you know, stage role that you have to grasp and 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 pretend that that's who you are. Uh, that that ultimately is not very satisfying. So, um, I I would hope that rather than there being a tension between the mask and something more authentic, if, if you like, or more um, subjective, uh, that, uh, you know, th there wouldn't be that tension. Masks are useful. Uh, um, and, you know, roles, roles are useful. And, and it seems like they're iterations, you know, that it seems like it's a learning process. A, a mask is, to me, doesn't seem to be a, um, it, it is a way to protect something. Something gets protected from going outside into the world with a mask and interacting. But there's nothing. There's nothing guaranteed about that. It's a very risky thing to do, and um, and it seems like you have to look. It, it seems like the best you can do with that is learn something. You know, the mask get hopefully gets altered by whoever's creating the mask. Uh, and that's probably a big topic too, but the mask gets altered by the interaction. And so um, for me, at least, that takes away some of the pejorative uh, aspects of, of, of the mask. I think it's a, it's a membrane. It goes, you know, it's not a thick mask. It goes out and protects. Um, I, I also, I thought about the way that masks, someone had mentioned ritual masks. And, um, and I think, I think of the way that that really reveals something about the person, you know, that they didn't know before, you know, to be behind a ritual mask where you're doing, you know, you have something pagan or something that's releasing emotions that you would never release and you know, releasing a, a self that you would never release in public. Um, you know, there, there's something, uh, you know, evocative about that, something revealing about that which is probably very useful, um, or at least satisfying, if, if, if not useful. Um, and it's nice to, with masks, it's, it's nice to go beyond, to think about going beyond the mask. The mask is not a solid thing. So it's always nice when you go out thinking that things are one way with your mask and, and the way it orients the world. And then you find out it doesn't, it, you don't have to filter things so much. You know, that's always a moment of great French, you know, friendship. An alliance is to find that not all of the elements of filtration of the mask were were really necessary. Um, 
I think that another thing that came up for me is thinking that being nice is a mask. I mean, I think that a lot of masks are, are trying to be nice and, and, and to go out and make sure that you are appropriate enough in society to get the resources and the things that you need to survive, right? I mean, people have mentioned about working and you know, making a living and that kind of thing. I mean, you, you sort of need to have a mask for that, but it's all, like I say, it's always nice to find out that you don't need so much of it, though. Um, I don't know. The other thing is about composers. I, I guess I had a little twinge when people like Beethoven were talked about as, as if they were uh, hucksters or something. It, that's the way I took it. I, I don't know if that, that was the way it was intended. But, um, you know, I, I see someone like the composer, more even than the musician, the composer, as, like Beethoven, as being, you know, as, as connecting, you know, connecting through ways of knowing how to connect with with, with an audience that connects sort of already and doesn't quite know it almost. You know, it connects with things that are, it, it's not to manipulate, it, it's not so much to manipulate as to reveal. And I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but anyhow, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, afternoon. So thank you. Thank you very much, James. This is a, um, you mentioned something that, that uh, so interested me. You, talk, you talked about getting, getting beyond the mask the the you you seem to indicate getting beyond the mask means that, that you will be without a mask whereas i think getting beyond the mask you will get to another mask it, yeah. the way i'm thinking about it is it's filtration you know and, and so yeah it's how much do i have to filter and i'm not sure that anything that i'm filtering is not just impulse when when we talk to a child you know we're um we're, uh, 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 you know, you know, we're restraining impulses that are conditioned, conditioned impulses to be angry when someone doesn't understand what I'm saying and all that. So, so we're, we're, um, um, yeah, I, I don't doubt. I, it probably would be another mask, but at least it seems like it's not as filled. It's not doesn't have that tension of, of restraining whatever that those impulses are it's not restrained so much if i if i can find out that my mask doesn't need that restraint it's always a relief to feel like i'm more human in a way because i you know i can relate to someone on something that is not filtered and not masked i don't know if that makes sense yeah fine thank you very much shame thank you very much excellent roland yeah <laughs> hi um <laughs> Well, um, I suppose uh, the thing that has occurred to me is um, it's a sort of broaden the idea of a mask uh, to the idea of an interface. Um, this is something which is sort of fairly central to a lot of my ideas in that um, uh, when, we, when you have a sort of self-else interaction, the idea of uh, our us perceiving ourselves as a self and then there is something to interact with then there is you could say an interface um, that enables us to uh, interact with that thing so i would go beyond the idea of masks to the idea of interface and say a mask in terms of how we present ourselves to people is a special case of an interface so uh, this idea of an interface, I would say, is uh, there. The, kind of Josh kind of touched on this idea as well, I think, um, uh, where you have a bundle of behaviors and uh, perceptions, which is a, a term I call a behavioral hypothesis, basically a, uh, a collection of um, ways of interacting coupled with expectations about how, how those interactions might happen might, might take effect that i could call an interface and um what i would say is that an interface in this idea is uh is like um uh a bridge between um one's perception of self and other systems that one or other influences that one encounters so the whole idea of an interface is a a kind of two-way influence 
mechanism where the things we do create an influence and the things that we interact with create an influence on us. And this interface provides um, um, a set of understanding behaviors and expectations about how that interaction might occur and how we can influence it. So um, uh, converting that idea or, or taking that into the idea of masks in terms of how we present ourselves to people, uh, my suggestion here is that you just can't get out of a mask in this sense. It's impossible to escape from an interface because uh, the very notion of interacting with someone or something requires this uh, collection of behaviors and expectations that give us that ability. So um, uh, take, for example, I mean, what, what, what one of the expressions that's come up and comes up repeatedly in uh, people talking about authentic self, Ron, you mentioned the concept in relation to self happens so forth. I, I think whatever is there right now is the authentic self. I mean, that is who we are. There is no way of, of saying, well, this, this interface that I've got going or this mask I've put on right now is in some way not authentically me because I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't part of me. So to my mind, the idea of an authentic self is just it's nonsense, really. I mean, the, the, in, in terms of something that's different from who I happen to be expressing myself as at that particular moment. So, um, so that's my take on, on, on masks, really. Um, concealment, by the way, um, that, that's quite an interesting idea, the idea of a mask concealing something. The word mask does strongly suggest um, something being concealed. The word, the word interface doesn't. It merely suggests a collection of behaviors that um, one can use to interact. That doesn't mean that an interface is, um, uh, is, is, is intera the interaction is without benefit or detriment to one side or the other. So I would say that a, um, a, a mechanism to influence someone in a negative way is as much of an interface as a mechanism to influence them in a positive way. Um, as far as concealment con is concerned, the idea of uh, <coughs> a, um, uh, a behavior being used to conceal something underneath, I suppose that really is in sort of in the eye of the beholder. So it would be about how someone perceives someone else's mask, whether they perceive the information being given uh, is, um, is of, uh, um, is, is, is you could say genuine in the sense that um, what they're going to be, how they're going to be influenced will be in a way that is positive for that person. So that's kind of how I would see concealment. Um, one last thing about AI. Um, I kind of share Ron's concern about this. Um, I think the current um, scope of AI may well not be a great deal to worry about. But um, if we kind of think about how AI learns, and I'm no expert at all on this, I'm sure there are other people like Terry who are going to be way more um, capable of, it, of, of, of explaining this, but to my understanding, the way um, uh, intelligent systems learn is through feedback. So it's necessary for a system to produce some kind of uh, action and it, essentially to construct and to create an experiment and then get feedback from that experiment. And from that, some kind of learning can occur. And um, I can't see any reason why a system could not be created that will do that. Um, and if that system is capable of redesigning itself within certain parameters as well, then I would say they could be what Michael described as a runaway uh, type of uh, development with AI, uh, because that intelligence would be able not only to uh, learn through extremely rapid experimentation and feedback, but it would also be able to expand its processing capabilities in ways that we might not understand right now by redesigning itself. 
and maybe not by really redesigning itself within its original design parameters, but actually through um, through techniques or processes that we don't understand. So yeah, I think that's probably a genuine a genuine threat. And um, but how and when that might happen, who knows? I think I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roland. Just just one tiny point. We, I understood. I understand why you said it, and I find it difficult to to argue with, although I do try. Um, <laughs> um, you, you said that uh, that somebody's authentic self is always authentic. I I can't argue with that, unfortunately, because I do. I I, I understand exactly what you mean. It is hugely problematic hugely problematic but but i can't find any way of discounting it which is problematic for me but i will think about it yeah well i suppose uh i i kind of contradicted myself slightly later on by saying well i think the authentic self the idea of an authentic self is nonsense because uh um it's it's like one is trying to split oneself up into authentic and non-authentic and then saying the non-authentic part is not part of myself it doesn't make any sense. In fact, I've seen this a lot in uh, like um, self-help type environments where um, there is a kind of, and the idea of full self and true self as well. Um, these ideas I think are very uh, bad for people um, in the sense that I feel that they encourage a sort of self-hatred. They, um, they don't honor the parts of us that we apparently don't like or think are you know, in some way bad. Um, and to my mind, uh, honoring those parts is as much as, as as important as honoring every other part. Uh, but you know, that's just how some people seem to think of things. But I, 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 I don't, I don't like that idea because to me, it, it seems very, um, inconsistent. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Roland. Abraham. Yeah. How are you uh, doing? Thank you again. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, first thought is uh, like authenticity, like a uh, very polluted word, I would say. My father, I, I respect him. He doesn't speak much. He might not understand what authenticity means at all. But he's, yeah, I would say. Anyhow, uh, the, the the thing I'd like to talk about is uh, how we think. I mean, uh, some people already hinted and even elaborated. Uh, so I, I, I'm appreciative, but I, I try to do my version of it. I would say if I can add any value here. So I think uh, often I find myself like daydreaming some people are more tapped into it, like a stream of consciousness, right? Stream of consciousness. So how much I thought about how much am I doing stream of consciousness, how I choose what pops out more outstanding than others. I think it, if I look at that, try to analyze, it's like a tree or, 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 or flowers, or, or, but it boils down to some core values or identity. I mentioned that I, I, I never uh, cursed my father, but the flip side of that, hypothetically, if I ever curse my father in the future, let's say, then I will see some part that I didn't realize that was in me or, you know what I mean? So in order to understand, for example, criminal, I don't have to commit all the crimes existed in the world, but at the same time, one way or another, I'm exploring something which was not my own. So again, it's a little a tangent, but stream of consciousness is like a flo floating around. And I don't think, I don't see it that way only. There, it's almost like a poetry, like Heidegger is saying, everything poetry, higher level. So what about being? When I think about it, this is very similar to how the paradigm, the worldview Heidegger is presenting. 
in my understanding. But the, the contradiction I have is that I don't know him personally very well, but he, he seemed to have uh, uh, the, the lucidity to articulate, incorporate some of the things in Lenghi's. So I, 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 I'm actually surprised at what language he's using actually. But the, I mentioned in previous remark that if this whole notion of progression of language sophistication and even AI might, not, might end up in impermanence, emergent property, which was uh, developed sophisticated in Eastern philosophy for a long time, or even you call it nothingness. But the, at least my understanding of uh, some part of Western philosophy, which is a part of me, is Christianity. Their onset and their worldview is totally different. We are the image of God. We are partaking his work. We are not just a random, let's say, emergent property. So I think there's, there might be different uh, worldview. So I think there is this question of mask we wear. We have to see, someone already mentioned that uh, what's behind mask? What's the essence or what's the self? Okay, what's the being? I think uh, mask is not the issue in a way. What's behind mask and how can we uh, kind of examine that here? Because everyone has so diverse worldviews or philosophy. So even though we speak English, at, at, at the bottom of it, the root is so different. So all, I think the, the, the value is that we can be, I, at least speaking of myself, I'm, I feel like this is like a poetry, not only stream of consciousness uh, time, like a poetry. Things are like floating around, but it helped me to, to go back my root in a way, or the belief I have, the faith I have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Abraham, thank you. Christina, sorry, you've been waiting so long and so patiently. No, I haven't waited. I just uh, absorb what, whatever people, say and and it's interesting because the more i listen the more uh, i think differently about this issue like uh, like i feel this longing that we have for that delusion of authentic self it's like we talk about mass but we are dream or uh, fantasize about this uh, this authentic yeah self that we might have somewhere and I'm wondering why uh, and I, I have a potential answer is uh, the fact that we are in a way polarized you know like somebody um, assimilates the idea that a lie is good lying is good because in in that person experience uh, when uh, that person lied it had a positive results so lying is good for that person for somebody else lying is bad because they were punished or so when I say polarize is because we might all tend towards that neutrality you know where when you are not polarized you are, you are just somebody who's neutral and who's able to be stable whatever happens you know around you like uh, when I say polarizes, because emotions could be positive or negative, but when you are in the middle, in the center, you are like away from all these disturbances. You are safe. Um, so, in my mind, masks are mandatory. You know, society doesn't let you uh, be uh, without filters. Like, imagine this guy that goes on the street. Uh, naked with his penis uh, outside. Uh, he's a weapon, right? And uh, the woman is the target. And uh, that's why you have covered women in uh, Muslim countries because they, they might be targeted, violated by uh, uh, these weapons. <laughs> um, 
sorry, I uh, I met, I uh, put some ideas and I tried to see like cover everything I wanted to see. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say again uh, that <clears throat> behind those masks, you can have different type of people. You you can have people more conscious conscious than others. Like uh, why? Because it's very difficult to see yourself. Um, you see yourself by interacting with people. Uh, if you don't have feedback, you don't know, uh, you, you cannot perceive yourself. So you perceive yourself through the behaviors of, of the other people. Like when people avoid you, you start wondering why or people avoid you, what's, what's the problem? And you start investigating and, and learning about yourself. And you, so that's why you, you need tools and skills in order to, to, uh, to understand and to know yourself. Uh, therapy, uh, interacting with people, uh, uh, being very observant. Like uh, when I was a teenager, I was uh, very, very sensitive. So when this boyfriend uh, was lying to me and saying uh, he, uh, he didn't cheat it or he was, uh, I, uh, my sensitivity let me uh, see that he was lying, but my lack of maturity didn't let me see that I was maybe uh, insecure, insecurely attached. And I was running after these people that were maybe not respecting me or, so yeah, I, 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 um, talked about more of the psychological side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. I, I, I agree with you 100% that there's this um, obsession to be authentic. And it, uh, it, it, this, is, this is run through this, this whole evening, the urge to be authentic. There's something wrong with masks. And mask is not a, mask is not a terrible thing. I mean, what does it mean to be authentic? Now here, here I've got a problem with Roland, but it suddenly occurred to me because Roland says we can only be authentic, and we, which is for the problematic now suddenly to me where it wasn't before, thanks to Christina, because um, to be authentic, the, this urge to to be to be real, to find the reality, to find out what you are. How can we find out what we are when we are there looking at ourselves subjectively? How can we possibly find that? It's an obsession I don't understand at all. I mean, I understand, I mean, because everybody says it. Everybody wants to be authentic. Why? What, what, what's, what's great about being authentic? Maybe your authentic self is horrible. I mean, imagine you take away the mask and you find somebody absolutely terrible under there. Put back the mask. So that uh, why why not? I mean, it, you know. So I I I agree with you, and the uh, p polarization. I agree with you as well. I've, I, as I as as I, as I mentioned, the, um, the the mask the mask presents a um, presents a paradox with ev with everything else, which I think is an important part of life in general. Paradoxes, uh, con contradictions. I think I think it's not a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I, I only say it's a good thing because I think that's that's what there is, and I shouldn't even say what there is because I don't believe in what there is. But anyway, that, that's something else. So, thank you very much, uh, Chris, Christina. Um, thank you, um, um, James. Barbara, hang on. You've been waiting so patiently. We're going to get to you. you. Don't have, don't go. You can, you can put her ahead of me if you like. Uh... Yeah, would that be okay? Sure. Thank you very much, Barbara. You, you've been given the stage. Okay, thank you. Thank, thanks so, for waiting. So I, I found interesting this word authentic because I think first of all, when we before we wake up, and we know that we're starting to wake up, and every day, and then the eyes go open, and I think that we we are at this second moment. I think we are authentic. That's my my really my own thoughts because i am not distracted i'm not thinking about anything yet no plans what i'm planning to do or stress and no knowledge just nothing just i am with myself and i think that this is the moment when i'm really authentic 
because when I stand up, I start my day. I clean my teeth, I go to the bathroom, I'm gone. I turn off the radio and I'm totally in another zone. Um, this is as I, as I think, because I'm actually not focusing on myself anymore. So, so this is like, um, like short information like that I can share. But the second thing what I was thinking about mask is when we actually start to wear a mask, when we are born like a babies, we don't have the mask yet, I think. But when we start really the mask, when we go to school, to kindergarten, where you start to really think and understand, that was my question actually, when I start to wear it. And also why take it off the mask? That I'm also asking myself too, when I, when I listen to these conversations here. So um, let's put this way, I'm not wearing the mask since baby and then I wear my mask when I'm eight years old because I have nothing to lose. I don't have teeth, I, have, I, I cannot hear, I cannot see, whatever happens, yeah? Accident happen, whatever. And I think that um, the question is where I really want to put the mask off when I have nothing to lose. So this is that's why I'm actually asking myself in these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got to tell you that when I, wait, when I open my eyes in the morning, I'm completely exhausted, and if if that's my authentic if that's my authentic self, I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Barbara. James, you've been very patient. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, the uh, I, I want to talk about three philosophers that I uh, really love, um, and those are uh, Spinoza, Hegel, and Heidegger. I'll try to be uh, quick. Uh, Spinoza is really important because he was kind of a model for these other philosophers. He was he's known as the system builder. Uh, he lived at a time when uh, religion was a compulsion. Uh, basically, people were obsessed. Uh, people in power were obsessed with religion. The laws required uh, religion uh, and uh, uh, kind of um, kind of like a piety was was basically uh, socially enforced. So uh, he wrote a book on philosophy that took this into account, uh, you know, and uh, he called his ultimate, uh, his ultimate uh, existence or his ultimate kind of reality, type of reality. Uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 an attempt at creating a uh, monism uh, and, and the ultimate reality was going to be substance and uh, substance was nominated as God because of course he lived in that uh, society where um, uh, religion of course was compulsive. But this, um, that, and then it, the, 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 so, so he's a really interesting philosopher because of how much he accomplished in, in, in his life and how much he accomplished in his philosophy. Uh, it, it, the book is called Ethics. Uh, the primary book, and then the uh, the other one is the next one is Hegel, uh, who is a really important philosopher at the beginning of the nineteenth century, uh, and uh, his idea was that uh, we could actually figure out what we're thinking by figuring out what we're thinking and how we're thinking about things. We figure out the things. So the primary thing about things is that we're thinking about them, and uh, so so and everything is kind of like overthought in that way. Uh, it's like kind of kind of like a uh, uh, kind of like a trying to suck up Kantianism into a overthinking about reality uh, thoughts of everything about reality. We end up with uh, really tremendous concepts along the way. Uh, the idea that science is correct, you know, like no, in other words, in the beginning of the nineteenth century, that wasn't necessarily a really popular idea. Um, and then, uh, although it was emerging, but his his eye, he came to the conclusion that you know through his thinking that science is correct, uh, and also this idea that rational animals will always be in conflict. In other words, we have a conflictive uh, nature. So that uh, maybe it's just a, sci a psychological idea. I think people have a tendency to confuse psychologic psychology with philosophy, but Hegel's idea is that we come to this, you know, through our thinking. In other words, it's because of the uh, 
the, the, the way we train our thinking is that we're going to actually develop um, compulsions to uh, exert dominance over other people. We're going to uh, put on masks that project dominance and uh, uh, fear and so forth. So these, this, the, the, I think the, 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 there hasn't been enough concentration on that sort of aspect of the mask. The mask is maybe this uh, actually uh, the mask that is socially trained to a certain extent. And Heidegger calls that, well, I, I really like people, the idea, you know, what I've learned here is that a lot of people are trying to come to grips with Heidegger because he's the most important philosopher in the 20th century. And his, uh, his, his uh, uh, idea of uh, achieving uh, authenticity is kind of on the basis of being an inauthentic being. We're all inauthentic beings. We all have to exist in society with a kind of like built-in inauthenticity of day-to-dayness. And out of, after this day-to-day -day life, out of this day-to-day -day life, we could create authenticities. We could create masks, if you're like Ron, is that that you know that that reflect uh, what we probably should be doing. You know, like if somebody mentioned Oppenheimer, I love that. You know, Oppenheimer. If he, damn it, if he wasn't so. Uh, authentic if he only hadn't been so authentic you know uh so uh so i just uh i kind of uh think uh, the discussion in that you know has has has, has had some very fruitful moves um uh transsexuals i mean i've always had this kind of like tremendous respect for transsexual people once i learned that that, that existed right and uh i mean it can be expressed for me as a, you know like from a Kind of like a heterosexual perspective or any kind of sexual perspective it's kind of like well you always know what you're getting in other words people uh who dress up to look like a certain sex are always kind of uh representing what they are in other words because uh if only because sexuality is real you know like in other words if i see someone who is a transsexual i always know what they're biological sex is, I could usually tell right away. And I can even say, wow, if it's a, a man in a dress, I could say, wow, good makeup, great dress, you know, and, you know, I really respect that guy. So maybe I'm kind of like jaded in some way in having that kind of perspective. But at the same time, this is the idea that I always had all my whole life since I was like, even in my 20s, is that these are People who have to be respected for uh, their determining what their authentic self was going to be in a uh, very unique, at that time, it was extremely unique, unique way. Maybe it's becoming more popular now, maybe it's the same, I don't know. But, but uh, this is, uh, and uh, uh, the only other thing I was going to comment on was somebody sometimes being authentic can look like um, being a uh, uh, psychopath. In other words, if you think that what is important in your life is yourself, then it starts to look a little bit like being a psychopath, you know, like Ayn Rand, you know, that idea. But at the same time, uh, most people, for most people, authenticity emerges out of and this is from Heidegger, but he's right about this. Authenticity emerges from what things are important. In other words, once you realize the things in the world, other beings that are important, uh, Heidegger calls them other beings, but at the same time, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's the beings you're alongside with in the world. Uh, those become this kind of mask, if you will, that is authenticity. In other words, we realize our full set of concerns and cares, who we are in our moods, in our thinking and so forth. And then we start to engage authentically with the world. And uh, that, 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 that's, that's basically what Heidegger is all about. And the only philosopher that we talked about that I think is really key because he's kind of a, on the way to Heidegger is Nietzsche. So, so yeah, def definitely the, 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 those, those ideas are very concrete. 
Uh, psychology is great, but we got to be very careful about substituting psychology for philosophy. Make sure we understand when we're talking about psychology and uh, not try to say that uh, this particular psychology is the, or psychological theory is the best way to think of the world philosophically. We've had great philosophers, and uh, that's what I wanted to sort of talk about is how these philosophers, why they're so important, uh, why people like uh, uh, for example, um, Sartre, Levinas, Derrida, um, they're all Heidegger babies. In other words, there's this, there's, this, there's this strength in this concept of emerging out of a, uh, basically an inauthentic world into an, into an authenticity. And, and that is the, that, that becomes the criteria for modern, I, I believe it's correct criteria for modern man to achieve uh, fulfillment of his essential capabilities and uh, clarity in one's thinking. So thank you. Thank you very much, James. Buddy, are you there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Right. No, I was just I was just kind of walking around as uh, I was listening to. So. <laughs> um, you know, the first part we you you guys started talking about authentic selves and false and self and all that. Um, just a little background. Uh, I am a Buddhist, so I was like, I am more leaning towards that way, and I will try to try to explain a li li little more towards the English side, I guess. So it's like. You, you talk about like Heidegger's and, and, and the rest of them. It's like, yes, I, I haven't read in time yet. So I'm, I'm working on that one. So, but I, I, the idea is like later on, I did read some of the critique. He says, you know, he, the conclusion he draws from it and it comes around with, he says that all the essential thinkers throughout the ages has all come to the same conclusion about human existence, right? So, I kind of agree with that. It, it kind of, it does, we all kind of draw the same conclusion. So what, what you, uh, I, I got distracted. So you guys were talking about why is it important to have authentic self? It, it's, you know, what, what and then you got to exa examine what's the false self, right? So false self, you know, self is a perception. So you have been drilled from the moment you were born, you know, to your family, to your culture, to, to whatever structure you come from, and you have been conditioned in that way. You know, not, not a bad thing. You've just been conditioned in that way to think certain ways, to look through point of view of your people, of your understanding and your culture's reference through the language and the rest of them. And you kind of stuck in that broad view. It's authentic self. It's not like, why do we want it? It's changing perspective. It's to broaden our perspective. It's to see the other side, right? That, that's, that's, that's about it. It's like this. You said Shakespeare. We're all players. You're stuck playing a role. If you're, <laughs> that's essentially what false self is. You're stuck playing a role. You can't go anywhere. You know, it, it's like you're a bird. You build a nest. You, 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 you know, you find a mate and you raise a nest and you do that again and again. And, until you die and you're perfectly content to do that. I never seen a bird says, hey, you know, today, this year, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I'm just gonna chill around, you know, hang out with my friend. Like, no, it, it's because they have been conditioned and bring it down to their structures. So in a way as human being, our false self is expectations. The, the you know, value installed by our parents and that, refine us to be in certain perspective and you can't change it. So you're in events, you're always stuck doing the same thing again and again, and then you're unable to escape this loop. So when we talk about authentic self, I think it's like in, in terms of Buddhism, it's you're seeking enlightenment. So what exactly is authentic self? It's shedding self, it's erasing one's perception, one's view by, you know, eliminating that and by adding this way, allow you to remove this barrier and add a little bit more to yourself. And, and you can actually start seeing the other person's view. So what exactly does this do? 
So how does that tie to, you know, authentic self and, and, and mask? And in my view is because we use masks for understanding with another person. So being authentic give you a way to communicate without being the same. You have come to an understanding rather than, oh, he is similar like me. I could understand him. That's, that's, that's what the mask does, brings a type of understanding. And why we feel betrayed is, oh, what's underneath could not be, could be different what's on the top. I think it is us who's being betrayed. And that's why we think mask is bad. So once you erase yourself and allow change your perspective, you can, uh, you can gain this control and manifest what you, the path of which you want these events to push towards. And that's, in my view, that's why I am looking for my authentic self. So it's like saying I am in a play, but throughout the play, I want to change. Act one, I want to, you know, whatever I want to be, I might be naive, I might be whatever. I want, it's because of this authenticity of oneself that allow you to progress to the next step, the next step, and you don't know what it is until it's fully come through. So it's really exciting. And that's why I seek my authentic self. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, buddy. Very nice. Jacob, you were very, very patient. Uh, can you hear me? Jacob? But we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Okay. Ah, oh, that's now, it. How about that? That's it. It's good. Good. Uh, so what are we talking about here? We're talking about authenticity. Is that the topic? Uh, authenticity no, is important really. because we want we want clarity we want lucidity right without lucidity there is no love no peace no joy no creativity right the brain must be totally free right of anything that interferes with seeing things as they actually are right isn't that necessary for life for life to see things as they actually are, to be in direct contact with what is, the isness of what's actually taking place from moment to moment. Not being in that state is very dangerous. It leads inevitably, as we have seen it through thousands of years of history, it leads to conflict, violence, suffering, right? So authenticity is really advantageous to the organism, right? Clarity, lucidity, right? So what will bring about authenticity now amongst us here so that when the meeting is over, right? At the end of the meeting, we will be free, free to look, to see things as they actually are rather than as we are. Because normally we're projecting, right? When you look at a bird at a tree, at listen to music, when you see your children, you don't see them. You see your version of them, which is a limitation, imitation, and distortion of what is, right? Which is an illusion. An illusion is anything that is not the truth. The truth is the whole, the whole. The illusion is the partial, the finite. And you're always with the finite rather than the whole. Only the brain that is totally free can see the whole and be in direct contact with the whole, direct communication, communion with the whole, right? That's what it means to be a human. Right now, we are not human. We are in human, right? We are out of order. We are out of the order of the natural order of the universe. Nature is supreme order. And we have fallen out of that order, right? So what is the what what will give birth now, right? To authenticity, right? To freedom. In other words, freedom, total freedom, so that the brain that is totally free acts, right? So that all our thoughts, all the words out of our mouth, 
and all our actions in daily life when we're at work, when we're at school, wherever we are, right, are the actions of a brain that is totally free. What will bring that about? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you. Uh, Christina. Yes, I will pick up on, on that uh, conflict that uh, Jacob was mentioning, but um, I, I was I was thinking also of this uh, conflict that you might have between these two parts, the educated self versus the animal, I call it animal self, between the behaved self and the pleasurable self, uh, self or the neocortex versus the limbic system. Uh, and I was thinking of those babies, you know, the, when you to toilet train them, you know, when you transform, you go from the animalistic side of him to the trained part of him. So I, I was just thinking that if, if it's not that longing that we have for the animal, you know, the, the, the animal that looks for pleasure and for happiness and all that, you know, <laughs> and this part more educated, that wants to control, that wants to, to because uh, somebody mentioned that the, the masks are actually uh, hiding the emotions. And this is what we do when we self-educate, -edu self-educate. Um, we just uh, try to, because we know emotions are those that do the most wrong in this world. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you very much. Uh, Debbie, um, from the, uh, everybody who talks now, please keep it short. I'm going to try and keep it really short. I was, Thank you I very wanted, much. <laughs> I wanted to talk about the history of... No, I'm joking. Uh, I, I just <laughs> wanted to actually relate, relate to this paradox that uh, Roland, you and, and Ron, talking about the question of is there what does this term authentic self um and especially when we have all these terms be yourself uh, finding ourselves um there's even this famous uh, saying uh be yourself everyone else is taken um and i i wanted i wanted i'm gonna try and make it short because i wanted to try and take the 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 concept of authenticity uh, uh the authentic self as not as something that represents some sort of self uh selfish um attribute of what we are as uh an inward reflection and there the authentic self um is is uh is discovered i would say that an, uh, an, an authentic self is actually an action. It is, it is something, it is, um, it, it, our self is authenticized by, uh, by our interaction with the other. The inner, the, there is some sort of, how I see it, some sort of um, uh, action, movement uh, towards the inward self that is the reflection, but ref these reflections, these inner reflections have a value only if they come out again, if they come out into the world and uh, into um, the uh, ethical uh, domain. So for me, all self um, um, uh, discussion or all self or authentic is actually to master ourselves within an ethical domain outside. Actually, just a tiny little bit, it, it actually relates also to the term, the etymology of authenticity, which means in Greek, um, to be a master of oneself. That is the authentic, I think it's the, uh, the self if we control uh, ourselves. We master ourselves in doing, 
uh, so the control of ourselves will always be outward in the ethical um, and uh, social sphere. Uh, and that I could go on, but I will stop. I don't know if that was clear that I'm talking about authenticity as an action, as a movement, and not only an inward reflection, but also an outward act in the world. That was my point. Thank you very, very much, Debbie. And it was short. Well done. <laughs> yes. you, you said a lot and it was short. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I expect the same from you, Josh, because you're walking. You're going to get tired soon. <laughs> you're hoping I'm winded, huh? <laughs> Just something like that, yes. <laughs> yeah. You better wish I'd take up jogging then. <laughs> I, I wish, I wish, I wish. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, take up Debbie's point. I like what she uh, said about uh, authenticity as action. I just thought uh, briefly I would uh, throw in what I think would be a little clarification of maybe uh, what distinguishes Heidegger's notion of authenticity from some of the others that have been put out there. For example, someone earlier talked about authenticity in terms of being in touch with what is really there, is really in front of us. And that's not Heidegger's notion of authenticity, because his notion of authenticity is it is closer to a Roland's notion of the interface. Uh, because it, 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 it's, it's neither something internal, nor is it it's something external. It's not us being in touch with you know, the real, authentic, actual, uh, independent uh, truth of the world around us. Uh, it is uh, the self coming to itself from the world around us. That is to say, the self essentially is reinvents itself through what it, it experiences. So there's this fascinating interplay between uh, memory between our own personal his history and how that history uh, connects with or melds with what is absolutely fresh and new in experience. So it is impossible, it's impossible to either experience something in the world which is absolutely of the world and absolutely independent of our own uh, approach to it, um, nor is it possible for us simply to imagine something which is entirely internal, concocted, which is not also uh, of uh, 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 containing within itself and outside. Um, so authentic, authenticity for Heidegger isn't something that we have. It's not as if when we're not acting authentically, we are being we are being caught up and conditioned by, you know, the the uh, the conditionings and the conventions of the world. It's more an attitude towards the world. It's impossible to actually lose ourselves in the world in that way, because even when we're doing that, even when we're conforming and you know acting and thinking and speaking in lockstep with others, it's impossible even to act with that degree of conformity without it having a doing it in a way which expresses why. Uh, it matters to us, why it is relevant and significant to us. So that, uh, th that uh, so, so authenticity is more a matter of sort of coming to recognize what is always already the case. It's not something that we have to then move toward from the state of being conditioned by the world. It's more of a recognition uh, that allows us to be able to, um, to, to see what has already been the case, which is that nothing in the world makes sense to us outside of the fact that it always matters to us in a certain way. It is always relevant to us for in a certain way relative to our purposes, aims, and goals. Okay, um, one more quick point. I just want to throw in this uh, comment, uh, my favorite psychologist, George Kelly, uh, said something about masks, which I thought was wonderful. Um, he talked about the kids trick-or-treating on Halloween and you know, Kate comes up to the door and is wearing a mask, you know, and is, is that not being true to the real self? Or in fact, in wearing the mask, are they in fact being more authentic? And what he meant by that is that you can use the notion of a mask, you can use it in therapy as a way, as, as, a, as a kind of an invitation to try on another way of looking at the world. Uh, you could argue that actors do this. They'll say that they don't get the part. The part often doesn't fit into place for them who they are, their motivation, you know, until they put on the costume. And then often, you know, it, it, who they are magically fits into place. 
uh, that's wonderful. You know, that, so is that losing themselves in a role? Is that being an authentic or is that, you know, an enriching of their sense of self? Just like the kid putting on the mask or any of us trying on a mask that allows us uh, perhaps to get unstuck from a kind of a, you know, an entrenched way of looking at the world, which just doesn't seem to be working for us anymore. So it can, it can be, it can, it can be among a variety of tools that we can use um, to sort of loosen up and explore and experiment with our sense of, of who we are. So you're not stuck in the old uh, authentic <laughs> uh, self. Okay, that, that was. Thank you very much, Josh. I'm just, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just wondering when you put on the mask, whether it's you experiencing the world or you want the world to experience you differently. I think it's- That's a great uh, one. I think it's um, I th I think it's uh, something that Christina said, and which I agreed with that there's a there's a paradox here, and um, which is always always there that um, uh, the pheno phenomena of masks are um, uh, they themselves take on the role of con contradiction and, and and paradox, and that I think is yeah. what is what you mentioned, Josh, that 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 that, that you become both. You, yeah. you you see the world differently. The world sees you differently, and I th that's that's not authenticity as far as I'm concerned. But it is as, is as far as Roland is concerned because all is authentic, and I and I see it, and it still troubles me. But uh, fair enough. So I do thank everybody, especially those people who stayed all the way through. We've been at it for almost three hours. And um, I'm delighted that you all came. Um, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, a summer holiday. At least I am. Um, two months. I'm going to rest my brain, whatever's left of it. And uh, we're going to meet again in September. I do hope you all come, and we continue with with other light subjects as today's was. So thank you very very much, everybody. Thank you. I'm delighted to see you. And we'll see you next time. If you've got any questions or anything you want to know, please write to me. I always reply. So bye, everybody. Be well.